Welcome to the Super Abundant Life Podcast, where we teach the Bible in a simple, authentic, and practical way so that Christians can skillfully apply the Word of God to create supernatural results in every area of life. This is your host, Olaomi Bridgway. Now, have you ever been in a situation where God showed you a promise in his word or he gave you a word and what you find yourself doing next or you plan to do next is to get out there and try and make that thing that he told you happen. So you basically try to arrange things on the outside just to help God a little bit. Have you been there? (laughs) Well, I have a few times until, you know, I came to the point where I realized there's no point in trying to do that. Yes, the Bible says faith without works is dead, but then works that are not directed by faith are also dead. That's one of the things that I've come to understand in my own life. And that's what today's episode is going to be about. Now, why am I sharing this episode today? And it's another um, blast from the past episode, if I can call it that. So it's an episode that I recorded as a Bible study earlier on, but I'm resharing it because I only want to put something out there that will be relevant to people in this season. Why am I sharing this particular episode? Because I can see Um, Looking ahead at the time that times that are to come, currently we are in we're living an unprecedented season where things have literally changed, and depending on how these all plays out, um, it's looking like people might you know begin to sort of scramble. I'm talking about Christians now. Uh, If jobs become shaky or the and or the economy becomes shaky or anything like that. It is quite possible that in trying to get themselves out of that situation, whatever the situation they might find themselves in, once all of this, you know, is over, that people may try to, you know, do different things to struggle and get themselves out of situations without God, you know, literally directing them to do so. And the only way that can go is not good, right? Faith without works is dead, but works that are not directed by faith are also dead so we need to understand that there's a place for actually staying with the word until an instruction comes out of that word and you know exactly what you ought to do so that's what i'm going to be talking about today when helping god when we try to help god and actually it leads to our own detriment and when i say help you know quote and unquote where god has not particularly asked you to do anything but because you know the promise because you have seen the word you just want to move on you just want to do something like god i'm not seeing any movement let's do something the same way abraham and sarah decided to go and have ishmael via hagar so that's what i'm going to be talking about today so i'm going to be teaching now this is a bible study that i taught earlier and i'm sharing it for the first time on the podcast it is really powerful um because i sat down and i listened to it and i actually took notes as in i need to hear this (laughs) for myself in this season i'm going to be talking about why you you know patience is actually the most important virtue that we can have in a season like this don't just jump out there trying to make things happen without being directed by the holy spirit because that in itself can actually cause more harm than good and then i'm also going to be teaching about the right response when god has given you a promise and it looks like okay there's nothing move you know there's no movement on the outside i need to do something how do we respond when god has given us a word what exactly do we do that will bring us a full manifestation so the topic for today (laughs) is when we try to help god when we try and i put help in inverted commas when we try to help god you know as if god you know can't carry something by himself and we feel like i just you know, I, I need to just help him a little bit he's moving a bit too slow or he doesn't seem to be clear <laughs> about him, what he wants to do you know god what's going on all right let me just help you a little bit now there are many instances in the bible where people have tried to help god several instances and 
um, it hasn't turned out very well, but the mercy of God always prevails. In all these lessons that we're sharing, one thing we can be confident about that we can literally rest in is regardless of our mistakes, regardless of anything that we do, um, when we step out of the way or you know take a foot wrong, God's mercy is always there for us to build us back up. God doesn't push us that push us down. He doesn't condemn us. He will always build us back up. So today's topic is when we try to help God. And we're going to be looking at why that's not such a good idea because the Bible talks about works of the spirit and then also works of the flesh. So today's Bible hero, uh, someone guessed and they said it was Abraham and Sarah. Now that's absolutely right because they did try to help God and Ishmael was what came out of it. And someone said it this way, if they hadn't done that, maybe all, you know, the Middle Eastern um, crisis may have been averted. That's one of the consequences of trying to help God. But they are actually not the people that we're looking at today. So today's Bible hero is actually Rebecca. So who's Rebecca? Rebecca was Isaac's wife. So before I give away too much, I'm just going to go into the Bible and then we'll start. Today, I only have one lesson, one lesson. Um, but what I'm also going to do once I've shared the lesson is um, teach what God has shown me and the process that he has taught me over the years about the right way to go about this. When we feel compelled, you know, things are not happening and you feel that pressure to try and move things on the outside. So let's start with Genesis 25, reading from verse 21. So Genesis 25, today's Bible hero, if you're just joining us, is Rebecca. So Genesis 25, 21 to 28. And this was shortly after Abraham died. So Abraham died and then he was buried. Um... It now says Isaac pleaded with the Lord on his with the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was unable to have children. So if, if, according to this, they had been married for, for 20 years. So they had been married for 20 years and then she didn't have any children. They didn't have children. So it says Isaac prayed, uh, pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was unable to have children. The Lord answered Isaac's prayer. Praise God for answered prayers. God doesn't withhold. And Rebecca became pregnant with twins. But the two children struggled with each other in her womb. So she went to ask the Lord about it. I'm going to come back to that. So she went to the Lord to ask about it. Why is this happening to me? She asked. And the Lord told her, the sons in your womb will become two nations. From the very beginning, the two nations will be rivals. One nation will be stronger than the other, and your older son will serve the younger. So God basically laid it bare to Rebecca. The same way God will show you, uh, he will give you a word. He will tell you something about your marriage. He will tell you a promise about your career or your children and so on. God doesn't hide things from us. He will not show you the whole thing from the beginning, but he, he, he has a way of showing you the end. He won't say, right, you know, step by step, every single from the beginning but he has a way of showing you the very end and the end actually is also not static it's dynamic the vision keeps getting bigger the more we walk with god so she basically went to god and said what's going on <laughs> this thought you know i don't even know if she thought it was twins at the time i think she was just you know having a difficult time with the pregnancy so she went to inquire of the lord um so let me keep reading and now says the first one it says it came for time for Rebecca to be delivered and she discovered that she was indeed pregnant with twins. So the first one was very red at birth and covered with thick hair like a fur coat. So they named him Esau. Then the other twin was born with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So they named him Jacob, which means supplanter. Okay. And Isaac was 60 years old when the twins were born. As the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter. He was an outdoor man while Jacob had a quiet temperament, like an introvert, <laughs> preferring to stay at home. Isaac lo loved Esau because he enjoyed eating the wild game Esau brought home, but Rebecca loved Jacob. So I'm going to pause there. So there are, there are two kids, 
very different temperaments, very different personalities. One was obviously outdoorsy, um, probably an extrovert, likes to hang around people, likes to, you know, get out, you know, into town and all those things. The other one was an introvert. He, pref he was quiet, he preferred to stay at home. If there were books at the time, this kind of person that would probably like to read and just literally, you know, go into themselves and all of that. But the two parents <laughs> loved each of the boys for two different reasons. So the Bible says Isaac loved Esau because of the fruit. So Esau would go out and hunt and then bring him game, all right, animals and cook. And he, was, he really loved that. So he enjoyed that. And I think much more, if we sort of dig deeper, I think it was more than the food. I think maybe he enjoyed, you know, his extroverted nature. It's possible, you know, they would probably sit down and just, and he just liked that about Esau. Meanwhile, the Bible says that Rebecca loved Jacob. Now, it doesn't say anything beyond that. It doesn't say, oh, Rebecca loved Jacob because, you know, they would sit at home together and cook together or whatever, or they love to read books together. You know, I'm just playing now, but you understand what I mean. The Bible doesn't say that. It just literally said Rebecca loved Jacob, meaning the implication of that is it is because of what she had been taught when they were when she was pregnant with them. So she had been essentially influenced by the vision. So God said, this is what is going to happen. Jacob is going to be the one that's going to rule over Esau. As a result of that, she preferred Jacob. She began to prefer him over his brother. She was entirely influenced by the vision God had shown her. If you see what I mean. So one thing I wanted, the first thing I wanted to point out here is this. And, it, you know, it leads on to much more. Rebecca actually started with God. Because I want us to see something. This was not some someone that didn't have a covenant with God, some random heaving or whatever. This was the wife of the person that bore the, the right of the covenant. This was Abraham's son's wife. When she began to have that initial challenge, so the same way when things begin to move in our environment, when uh, maybe the job goes or the business collapses or there's trouble in the marriage or something happens, we usually know to go to God. That's what Rebecca did, all right? She went to God and she cried out to God and she said, what is going on? Show me. And God was very quick to show her the end. He showed her the vision. He said, this is actually what's happening. This is where this is going to lead. So essentially, she started with God. Her first point of contact in the middle of that crisis was God. And that's usually typical for a lot of us Christians. We would go to God first, and that's very commendable. But what now happened after that was she took that word and then she literally began to act on it. There was no blueprint from God as to how it would happen, as to how God wanted it to play out. It was literally, ah, okay, so Jacob is going to be the favored one. I need to do everything I can to make sure it happens, to make sure it happens, okay? And as a result of that, the Bible says Rebecca loved Jacob. So she started to treat him differently than his brother. So the thing is, when she had some insight into the mind of God in that situation, she immediately switched to her own intelligence to make it happen. So it's, a, it's one thing to start with God. But then the beginning is literally just that, the beginning. God shows us the end, but we are not at the end yet. We're only at the beginning. And the reason why he shows us the end is to almost lock us in, to say, this is where I'm taking you. This is what's going to happen. If you think about Abraham, God said, come out of your country, from your kindred, <laughs> your king's man, king's men, and I will, to a land that I will show you. Um, and he gave him all these promises, father of all nations. And, you know, in Hebrews, the Bible talks about how Abraham and all these people did not actually enter into the promised land. They didn't. They lived in tents all of their lives because that was just the beginning. It was going to transcend them. So this is how God operates with us. Even when you get to the point where, oh, this vision God has given me, by the time you get to that, I'm like, oh, I'm so relieved, you know, 
before he even blink, he has moved the goalpost again. He has, you know, begun to show you something else. And you can barely just stay and relax and enjoy where you are and say, okay, I'm just going to stay here. You know, because he's already calling you into something else. He's already calling you deeper. He's already calling you higher. So God, that's how God operates with us. He will always show us the end. But sometimes we forget that what he's showing us is the end. There is still quite a process through him and in him to go from where we are to where he wants us to be. All right. And the frustration comes when we feel like that word he has given is validation to go and accomplish it. No, it's not validation for you to go out and go and accomplish it. It is validation for you to trust in him to take you there. I hope you can see the difference. There's a difference. There's an absolute difference. Think of it this way. You set a destination and you say that, um, okay, I'll, I'll use Uber as an example, all right? International, um, what's the word? <laughs> Brand. So we all know Uber. I want to go somewhere and I, you know, I set my destination, I'm going to Uber. So once you set your destination and you say, oh, I'm going to this place, you have, what you literally called for is somebody to come and take you there. You don't, you don't take your app, call an Uber, and then start running around and say, okay, everyone you meet on the road, how do I get there? I'm just what I'm going to. <laughs> That's what we try to do. So once the destination becomes clear to us, we now start trying to do things. Meanwhile, what happened is someone is coming to take you there. God is now going to work with you step by step to take us there in the shortest possible time and avoiding a lot of things usually that have, you know, that we can, a lot of trouble that if we had just followed God in the first days could have been avoided. The Bible says about the children of Israel, the, the journey in the wilderness was meant to be what, 11 days, but they died there. So God does not, he, he, he's not going to stretch something out beyond what is necessary. He's not going to allow temptation to overcome us beyond what, it, you know, to come to us beyond what is necessary. So that's what I wanted to point out first of all. Now, Rebecca got that word and immediately it colored the way she treated her two children. She loved Jacob, not because of his personality, not because of anything, but because of that word. And she began to treat him differently. Now, we all know about all the different things that she did later on, but I'm not going to do that, say that now. We'll come to that later on. But what I do want to do is I want us to compare this with Mary, Mary, the mother of Jesus. Almost a similar situation. So the angel came to Mary and said, highly favored above all women, da, 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 this is what's going to happen. You're going to have a son and his name will be Jesus and he will save his people and all that. Basically, you're about to be pregnant with the son of God. Now, if you read about Mary and the life of Jesus as a, as a baby and as a child growing up, the Bible always says that Mary kept this thing. So every time she heard a word from God regarding her son, or every, or every time she observed something, the Bible says that she kept it in her heart. That no point... At no point do we have any record of Mary trying to orchestrate or trying to move things around for Jesus to become the king of the Jews. There's no record of that. In fact, when Jesus tried to stay back in the temple when he was 12, Mary said, no, he's, you're coming with me. <laughs> you're going home. That's where you're supposed to be. Because if you think about it, if it was Rebecca, right, with the way she handled the Jacob Esau thing, at 12, Rebecca would have said, okay, Pharisees, you need to be listening to this boy. He's the king of the Jews. He's the one that's supposed to be, uh, that's going to save all of you. Do you understand what I mean? But Mary never did that. She literally kept, you know, what you say you keep something. So the first one, she kept building a, a layer upon layer of a strong image. And as a result of that, she never lacked instruction of what to do at every stage. Okay, every step Jacob, sorry, every step Joseph and Mary took in relation to Jesus was a direct instruction from God. Direct instruction from his conception, Jesus's conception, to when Joseph was about to put Mary away, 
right? These were people that were completely dependent. After he was born and Herod wanted to kill him, they were dependent on God. God said, move him to Egypt. Okay, stay in Egypt. Okay, now come back. So that the word, and I loved what the Bible said about that. Every time, if you read Matthew's account, you would always, always say, so that, it, as it was, um, let me read exactly what it says. So that it might be fulfilled that which was spoken. So go to Egypt so that it might be fulfilled that which was spoken. So God by himself was fulfilling his words through all these instructions. All right, do this, do that. That is how God expects the vision that he has shown us to be fulfilled. He doesn't expect us to toil. He doesn't expect us to rely on, on our own intelligence connections. He will literally begin to show us exactly what to do. Now, I, um, this verse of the Bible, I believe, sums everything I've been saying so far up perfectly. Now, Paul was writing to the Galatian church. These were people that started in spirit, the same way Rebecca did. They, they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit by the, of, of baptism of the Holy Spirit by the Spirit. They were doing exploits, gifts of the Spirit. But then after a while, they left all of that and then they started trying to earn, trying to do works to justify themselves. And this is what Paul said. Paul said in Galatians 3 3, he said, How foolish can you be? After starting your new life in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? That sums everything up perfectly. Rebecca started in the spirit. She went to God and said, what is going on? Show me the end. But then everything she did after that was literally her own human effort. She tried, started, if you read that, there was a lot of lying, lying. <laughs> She would say, let your curse come upon me. If your father curses you, it's okay. I'll collect the curse. As in, talk about desperation. And it just showed that maybe she didn't trust that what God had said would come to pass. Maybe she observed the situation and thought, mm, the way I'm looking, I think God is not going to, you know, he, he's not going to do it. I think he saw, he's precise because she was looking at the relationship. Maybe she expected that as a result of what God wanted to do, Jacob, Isaac, sorry, Isaac would love Jacob, right? Maybe she would have relaxed if she had seen some signs on the outside that, ooh, you know, this, he's a favored one and so on. So I don't need to worry. Let me just relax. I can see that God is already moving. But it was the exact opposite. Isaac loved Esau, wanted to spend time with him, only wanted to eat his food. Meanwhile, Jacob just seemed like, okay, my second son. Hey, okay, how are you? That was it. There wasn't a special bond. So she felt, hmm, God is not moving. This thing that God has shown me, I have to make it happen. The same way God will show us something about anything. He shows you and the first thing you want to go and do is manipulate situations to try and move things around. So Paul asked the Galatian church, he said, after starting in the spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort. Now, what are the consequences? Now, remember all of this is leading up to just one lesson. There's only one lesson today, and I'll say the lesson at the end shortly. I told you it was going to be a short one today. <laughs> so what are some of the consequences of trying to help God? So I'm going to go over that and then show you, as I promised, what is the right way? What's the right response, particularly particularly when you have the word, but you look around you and it looks like God is not moving. So let me go and help him, okay? There's a way to respond. Now, Genesis 27, I'm going to show you one of the consequences um, here. So Genesis 27, 42 to 45. And the words of Esau, our older son, were told to Rebecca. So this was after, um, just to do a bit of a refresher course in the Bible, essentially, when it was time, when Isaac was nearing the end of his life, he called Esau and he said, I'm about to die, right? So here's what's going to happen. Go and cook me that delicious meat that you always cook me. And once I've eaten it, I'll be so happy. I will just release blessings upon blessings upon you. So Esau, off Esau, Esau goes. But Rebecca, again, he, because the thing, the thing about it is, God is the one that created Isaac 
right? Are we saying it was impossible for God while he was sleeping, waiting for Esau, for an angel to appear to him and say, Isaac, no, Jacob is the one you're supposed to bless. God has a million ways he could have done it. He had a million and one ways, but Rebecca didn't wait. She didn't trust God. She thought, ah, this is it. It's finished. I have to move now and I have to move quickly. Even if it meant lying and cheating and um, risking getting cursed. She didn't care. She was moving now. I'm going to do it now because it looks like this God. He doesn't know what he's doing. It just looks like everything is about to scatter. So it doesn't matter. I'm going to you know, compromise everything. I know my values in order to get this thing. So she calls Jacob and she says, look, we're going to deceive your father. So go and deceive him and get the blessing. That just shows a simple lack of trust. A simple lack of trust, number one, in God's integrity and in God's power. Right? Integrity and power. Integrity means, but if God says it now, he knows what he's doing. He won't lie. He wasn't lying when he said that. And power, even if she believed in God's integrity, maybe she thought, I don't think it can happen again. I think my husband is too stubborn for God to come and change. You know, he can't, God can't do it. I need to do something. I need to, you know, show him a lesson. I need to treat, you know, do this, da, 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 da. I need to do this. I need to do that. I don't think God can touch this person. I don't think God can change the situation. So I know what to do. I'm going to go and compromise. So it was literally a lack of trust in God's integrity and in his power or his ability. So she sends Jacob off to go and deceive his father and to receive the blessing. So he says that when Esau, so <laughs> as you can imagine, Esau came back and hey, he was angry. He, in fact, he stood there on that spot and he promised himself that he was going to kill Jacob. The only reason he didn't kill him dead that is that was he thought, let my father die first. I don't want to do this. I don't want to cause my father grief. But as soon as that man is dead and I finish mourning him, Jacob, you are dead. I will kill you. So the words of Esau are all that son were told to Rebecca. So she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, surely your brother Esau comforts himself concerning you by intending to kill you. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee to my brother Laban in Haran. Now, listen to this. She now said, and stay there with him a few days. And stay there with him a few days until your brother's fury turns away, until your brother's anger turns away from you, and he forgets what you have done to him. Then I will send and bring you there. Why should I be bereaved also of both of you in one day? So she was like, oh, a few days, that's the consequence. It doesn't matter. Just go. I'll see you in a few days. We all know that um, Jacob ended up spending years, at least 14 years. It was much more than 14 years. Because even after he married um, Rachel, 14 years, he stayed there a long time and had children and so on. So I don't know exactly how many years, but we're looking 20, possibly 30 or more. Something that was supposed to be a few days. But it was delayed. It was supposed to be a few. And he never saw his mother again. He never. And the thing is, you don't know how God does these things. Like I said, the one that pops into my own head is, God could literally, as he's about to put his hand on Esau, God would have said, stop it. No, <laughs> it's not him. And an angel will show up and say, no, it's Jacob. Any, anyhow. In a dramatic way, in a still small voice, God knows how to do these things. Or he could have literally at the last minute thought, hang on, Rebecca, I remember you went to see that prophet when you were pregnant. What did the prophet say? And he could have changed his mind at that point in time. God has a billion and one ways. Just because something looks hopeless does not mean God will not do it. So that temptation to want to, out of anxiety, out of fear, out of worry, to want to jump in, honestly, it messes things up. It may delay it. It may, you know, um, and there's some things I've said here. It could end up destroying. I'm going to show 
I'm going to show where it destroys. So in this case, it was significantly delayed. It was significantly delayed. Okay. What was supposed to be him leaving his, his homeland, the land of promise for a few days ended up being, I don't know how many years, 20, 30. I need to look into the Bible to find out how many years, but surely probably about 30 years before he could come back to the land of promise. Okay, so I was going to look at other cases in the Bible before we find now go and talk about um, today's lesson. So jo Joseph was another one. So people say eh, Joseph, you know, he, he you know, when you have your dream, you just be sharing it because people need to hear. Um, I don't know if Joseph had to suffer everything he suffered. To be honest, because remember, Jesus is our ultimate example. God came and he demonstrated how we should be, all right? How, we, how to enter into destiny. He demonstrated it. If we go and read the life of Jesus, we see very plainly. So I'm not sure Joseph was supposed to suffer. Are we saying that the only way God could have gotten Joseph to Egypt was as a slave? I don't think so. I'm sure God had other ways that he could have done it. But again, this is another person where God reveals the end to him. And you know, think about it this way. Do you think Joseph was telling all those dreams to his father and his brothers because he was just like, oh, I'm so excited. He was telling them, I think, to lord it over them, to tell them, listen, you guys should be listening to me. You guys should be subject to me. All right? And as a result of that, the only thing he stirred up was not the submission he was looking for, but hatred. And his brothers hated him to the point that they won't, they almost killed him, but for the mercy of God. So it was the mercy of God that intervened that one of the brothers, was it Judah, I said, please don't kill him and sold him into slavery. They were about to kill him. They were about to snuff that vision, destroy that vision forever. Why? Because he received the word and then he decided, this is how I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to talk about these things until they hear me, until they begin to say everything that I'm... Did God send him? No. Was he a prophet? No. There are prophets where God will show things and God will immediately say, go and broadcast it, shout it from the rooftops. We don't see anywhere where that instruction was given. So it was something that he chose to do of himself. The second example is the Israelites. Now, after God told them that, you know, I have given you the land, and they were like, oh, there's giants in the land, and all that. So God said, okay, fine. There are giants in the land, as you have spoken, so will it be. And God said, you're not going in again. Now, after that, I'm going to read Numbers 14 to you. It says, when Moses reported the Lord's words to all the Israelites, when God told them, okay, because you have denied me, you're going to die in the wilderness. Now, listen to how these people responded. Said the people were filled with grief. So they were sorry. So they were sorry. They got up early the next morning and went to the top of the hills. Let's go, they said. We realize that we have sinned, but now we are ready to enter into the land that the Lord has promised us. But Moses said, why are you now disobeying the Lord's orders to return to the wilderness? It won't work. Do not go up into the land. You will only be crushed by enemies because the Lord is not with you. So he told them and he warned them, but they said, no, we're going. <laughs> so they went anyway, but God was not with, it was not an instruction given by God. And some of them were destroyed because they thought, okay, this is, this is the vision God gave. This is how God said, go back to the wilderness. It is your children that will enter into it. God was clear about that, but they decided, no, no, no. We don't, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. God says, you know, gives you a specific way he wants you to do it, a specific instruction, but you don't like that instruction. So you say, no, no, you just push it and suppress it and say, I'm going to do it my own way. These guys, that's what they did. God said, it's no longer you guys, it's your children. Go back. They said, no, we don't want it to be our children. We want it to be us. And they went anyway, and some of them were destroyed. They were killed. So all of that basically is going to bring me to my one and only lesson today, okay? And my lesson is this. What you started with God, so the thing, the vision, the project, whatever it is 
that you started with God, God began the process. He showed you the, the vision, the end. Don't allow selfish ambition to derail, delay, or destroy it. So what you started with God, don't allow selfish ambition to derail, delay, or destroy it. Just as um, Paul said to the Galatians, what you started in the spirit, don't try and perfect it with human effort because it only leads to death. That's what the Bible says. It says the carnal mind is enmity. So when we try to create things out of our own intelligence, out of our own minds, all right, you have not received that instruction. Now, someone might say, how does this work practically? So does that mean that God gives me a word and then I just sit down and I don't do anything and I'm just waiting for the word to come to pass? Yes and no. Okay. Yes, in the sense that you wait on God until you receive an instruction. No, in the sense that your waiting is not a passive kind of waiting. So you're not sitting down, just, you know, watching TV all day. God tells you you're going to build the largest, uh, I don't know, uh, telecoms business or something. And okay, I'm just waiting for God to come and tell me what to do. And you're spending all your days just, hanging around, you know, wasting time. You're waiting, but you're not waiting passively. You're waiting actively to hear what he will say. And this is how we do it, okay? So I'm going to use this. So this is the right response when God shows you something. When God tells you a word and he shows you a vision. All right, Luke 14, 28 to 30. says, for which of you intending to build the tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it. Less, after he has laid the foundation, is not able to finish, and all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. So it says here, the same way you want to build a house. God has shown you you're going to build this house, this marriage, this you know your child's life, this business, this career, this health, whatever it is that he has shown you, right? At the beginning, there's nothing. In fact, sometimes there's less than nothing. It looks completely impossible at the beginning. But remember, the word came not for you to begin to try to do it. The word came for you to begin to trust in God for him to take you there. There's a difference. There's a difference. So what, what does the Bible say that we should do? It says, first of all, sit down and count the cost. Now, Jesus used that term deliberately. He says, count the cost. What is it going to cost me so that I can make sure I have enough? Now, if you think about, he used building as an example. So an architect, someone wants to build a house, okay? How do you count the cost? Is it by sitting and thinking, mm, okay, maybe I'll need, by estimating and saying, okay, I'll need five bags of cement. Think about it. Anyone wants to build a house, what, who is the first person they bring in? The architect to draw the blueprint. So the architect is the first person so that you can actually get the ideas in your head down on paper so that you can see. And then based on the architect's drawing, the engineers will come in and they'll say, right, this is what it's going to cost. So literally when he's saying to count the cost, it means you need the blueprint. It means you need the blueprints because some of my think, okay, to build a five-story building, mm, it's going to cost me times five of what I need for a bungalow. And they estimate it like that without a blueprint. Now, that is an error because you don't know. But if you have a, an exact blueprint, you know exactly what it's going to cost you, give or take some expenses, some minor expenses. So that's literally what Jesus was saying there. He's saying that you need to have a blueprint of heaven regarding that particular venture. And what's a blueprint? A blueprint is what shows you, okay, this is what you do, this is what you do. You have a clear vision of the next step to take. So if an engineer, a builder, has a blueprint, he can build the whole building. Why? Because he knows, okay, we'll start here and then this is what we'll do next. So you know per season what to do next. You know per season what to do. You always know what step to take next. 
you always know what step to take next. And how does that come? How do you get the blueprint? You know, Jesus said, he said, I do nothing except that which I see the father doing. Jesus lived like that. And he's calling us really to come to that place where for the things that he has shown us to stop trying to stop wearing ourselves out and stop, you know, diminishing the quality of our lives in trying to get it happen and living with worry and anxiety and serial disappointments and failures that could very well have been avoided if we had literally just waited on God and received his instruction on exactly what to do. That shortens the process and it cuts out a lot of things, heartache that we don't always have to go through. So how do we do that? How do you sit down? What does it mean to sit down? You literally take the word God has given you and you begin to meditate on it. You begin to meditate on it. You begin to confess it to yourself. You begin to pray in the spirit about that word. And you wait. So you, the things, so you can, for example, let me use the example of someone that wants to move forward in their career. So you are going to work every day. You don't stop and stay at home and say, God is going to show me a blueprint. <laughs> And you stop going to work unless instruction will stop working. So you carry on with your normal day. The Bible talks about the man that plants the seed in the ground. He goes about his business. He doesn't know how it grows. It's exactly the same thing. You take the word, you take that desire, take that vision God has given you, and you begin to pray and meditate over it. You go on with your normal business. You can even start to research, okay? You can start to read books. You can start to put your, do you understand that? But you don't take a step. You don't move forward until at least there's some kind of conviction in your heart as to what it is you're supposed to do. And if you do it that way, the desires will begin to come. The ideas will begin to come. An idea will just pop into your head as in, oh, I think I should do this. And then you do it and like, boom, the door just opens like that. You don't have to force it down. You don't have to try and kick it down. You don't have to do any of those things that we do in trying, in compromising ourselves in order to try and help God. It honestly becomes effortless when we live this way. But it is the fact that a lot of us can be impatient. We want it now. We want it now. Or it looks impossible. I don't think God can do it. We don't say it, but we think it. We might not say it out loud, but we're thinking, I think I should just do this thing. You know, I don't think God can save this marriage. So I'm just going to do it my way. Those are the kind of things when we, when we don't wait on God and we try to help him. So that's what we need to do. It says you sit down in order to get the blueprint. What is God saying? How does he want you to approach this? And honestly, it's a way that is hassle-free because you literally just put pressure on the word, not on people, not on circumstances. You don't try and manipulate people to get what you want. You literally put pressure on that word. And before your very eyes, the doors will begin to open. And you'll be like, wow, this is all so easy. Why is it so easy? That is kind of like God has called us to. The hard part is the sitting still and putting pressure on the word, praying, meditating. It is hard because we want to do, 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 do. Let me, what can I do? What can I do? Let me go and do this. We want to do, 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 do. The sitting still is the hardest part, but it is the requirement. It's a prerequisite. If you're going to effortlessly enter into what God has for you. 